I am not Andrea. My name is Maureen Anderson, and I'm just going to fill in. Um, I think she's going to be coming late. Good morning, and welcome to the September meeting of the New York City Workforce Development Board. I'm going to share highlights from today's agenda, some reminders, and some housekeeping notes. Um, today, we will hear an overview of community hiring from Doug Lopari, the new Executive Director of the Office of Community Hiring. Community hiring pertains to leveraging the city's enormous purchasing power to require its contractors to prioritize hiring low income individuals and residents of low income communities for NYCHA development. Additionally, you will hear about the City of New York's commitment to advancing the career success of people with disabilities through a collaboration among three narrow offices the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities the Mayor's Office for Talent and Workforce Development, and the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Please note that we will be ending our meeting early today at 10.30 a.m. Housekeeping items. Please note a few housekeeping items. The state's open meetings will apply to the Workforce Development Board since it is considered a public body. The open meetings law was temporarily flexible during the worst of the pandemic, but now requires once again that the board have an in-person quorum in order to conduct business. Additionally, members may participate remotely if they have a legitimate reason defined in the law, but they do not count towards a quorum and they cannot vote. We have several members participating remotely today. Please also note that we are video recording today's meeting and that we will be posting the recording online, which is required by the state open meetings law. As a long standing policy, we ask that only board members speak during the meeting. Um, good morning, everybody. We are not using microphones in this room, but there are mics hanging from the ceiling so that the people. Uh, that are participating virtually can hear us less. Can you still hear us okay? Okay, great, great. Um, I, we have a couple of goodbyes to say today. Um, we are going to acknowledge two members today who are uh, both have decided to leave the board for personal reasons. Um, our uh, wonderful pinch hitter, Maureen Anderson. Um, <laughs> um, Maureen joined the board, I believe, in 2017. Christine? I wasn't on the board. Oh, okay. Until? 20, I think 17. And okay. before okay. that, I was on the company. We always come in. And she has been a very longtime champion for people with disabilities. She works. Um, most recently as the local business relations representative for the New York State uh, Access VR, which is vocational rehabilitation. It's all about providing education, training, employment to people with disabilities. Uh, and she has been there since 1999, I believe. And she just retired. So congratulations. Um, um, and Maureen was also a very active member of the board's racial equity committee during the, which was very active during the first part of the pandemic. Um, and I would say, you know, Maureen and I first started working together right after WIOA was passed. WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act law. Uh, and she was a partner who was one of the required partners under, uh, under WIOA. And she was, <laughs> very passionate about helping people, very passionate about plugging into the broader Workforce One Career Center system, but also to adult literacy programs and to New York State Department of Labor's programs. Um, and she has just been a, a tireless warrior for uh, people with disabilities. Um, so we're really gonna miss her. Uh, and I really enjoyed working with you and I'm sad to see you go but I wish you all the best in retirement. And you know, you're always welcome to stop by these meetings, which are now in person. Thank you all for being here. Um, so let's give Maureen. We have someone else to say goodbye to. 
less bluestone. Um, and less is a very long standing member of the Workforce Development Board. In fact, it wasn't even called the Workforce Development Board when he started. It's the Workforce Investment Board, the WIB. Um, and, you know, not only is he one of the longest serving members, he is also one of the most active, engaged, passionate, uh, vocal members that we currently have. Uh, he's also one of our funniest members. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, we're really going to miss your sense of humor less. We're going to miss your willingness to ask questions and really engage with programs and with the policies that we set. Um, and I really just want to thank you for so many years of service to our board uh, and to the executive committees and the executive committee for well. I want to thank you on behalf of the board, on behalf of New York City employers and on behalf of New Yorkers who have benefited from our system that you've helped to receive for the past 15 plus years. Thank you very much. We will miss you and wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. I'll miss you guys too. Unless you have still seniority. So if, if and you're, you're, you're not the person short of words, so if you would like to say anything to address the group, say goodbyes, you, you are, are welcome to. I, I'm, I'm going to miss the board. It's been a great organization. It's evolved tremendously over the years. And um, I'm happy to pass my uh, seniority crown on to Mark, who will carry it in good stead, I'm sure. Um, but, it, but it was a great experience and, and I wouldn't have I, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. And I, I'm glad to have been a part. Do you want to say anything? Sorry. Um, no, no, I don't actually have a lot to say. It's a little overwhelming, this whole process of retiring. Um, but I have to admit, uh, reading, um, reading what's going to happen today, I'm very thrilled because I feel like we've been working for a long time to get services for people with disabilities um, in the workforce development centers. And this is just, I feel like I'm just passing along the torch. The next phase is coming, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Audrey Collins, the chair for the board. I'm so sorry I was late. It's a bit of a hectic commute this morning. Um, so thank you for moving us along. So now we're going to a brief update on the youth viola programs and summer youth employment program small correction to your agenda valerie mulligan was unable to make it today so we will hear from megan enan ferryman <laughs> um, assistant commissioner at dc lighting thank you very much good morning everybody um really briefly i just have some quick updates to share SYEP concluded on August 19th, and we served over 100,000 youth this summer, so that's really incredible. Um, as part of that, we served a record number of participants um, that were set aside for youth with barriers to employment, so young parents, homeless young people, young people in foster care, et cetera, so we're really proud of that as well, really trying to reach people who otherwise might not have um, an easy path to a summer experience. Um, we also had a record number of job placements in city agencies, something else we're really proud of. Mayor Adams has been really, really vocal in pushing all of our city agency partners to uh, host interns. So we did that this summer and just raising the bar uh, to do more next summer. Um, we're putting together our annual summary now. That should be out in the next months with all the details and breakdown of demographics and um, sectors and all the wonderful tidbits um, that went on this summer. So that's really exciting. And then really super exciting for me personally is that this morning the WIOA Youth Program concept papers were released. They're out. I will send the link to Chris 
Um, so those papers are out for both the out of school youth program and the in school youth program. Um, for the out of school youth program, what we really focused on in the concept paper was trying to continue to grow our training for growth occupations that lead to credentials. And for the in school youth program, we are trying to make sure that there's a paid work experience during the school year, as well as an opportunity for participants to get CUNY credit while they participate in the program. So um, the deadline for comments for that is October 25th. As I said, I will make sure that Chris gets the link and everybody gets easy access to look at those on way in. Very much. Thank you. Sorry, Yeah. Question: One hundred thousand. Two questions. One: How does that compare to a year ago in pre-COVID? And secondly, how many New Yorkers are in that age group? I mean, are we reaching even ten percent? I mean, it seems like a huge number. It is a huge number um, in terms of like an actual. Like population, look at the number of people. I don't know offhand, but that's something we can certainly look at. Um, How many applied? Like this year, we had 176,000 applications. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I think that you know, Mayor Adams has been really clear that he wanted to get to 100,000 young people. I think last year we were just shy of that, about 95,000. So to hit this benchmark is very awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in, you know, at DYCD when we had like 30,000 young people. So over mm -hmm. the course of the last, you know, 15 years, this program has really grown. And I think it's, um, you know, the city really has been committed to the summer program. And it's great to see how. And Megan, just to, sorry, not to, sorry, one second, um, not to toot our own horns, <clears throat> but isn't this, isn't the New York City SYP program by far the largest by in far. the entire country? Yeah. I mean, the next biggest one is maybe 30,000 Chicago maybe. or something. Maybe. So maybe not mean? even, like, it's, it's exponentially mm -hmm. larger than any other summer program up there. <clears throat> so nobody, nobody does it. <laughs> no, just the, uh, the question on the, the you said there were 176,000 applicants. Uh, the 76,000, they just didn't, they applied but then didn't come back. And what's that, what's that process? So, you know, the process is primarily driven by lottery um, in the community based programs that we run. So, if you have a barrier to employment, you have a little bit of an easier, smoother path to come in. So, some of these programs for youth that are harder to reach, harder to serve. There is more of a direct recruitment, um, but for the community-based programs where you would apply and get chosen through the lottery, sometimes you just don't get chosen. Um, and that's, you know, I think, again, part of the push that we are always doing to try to really get more funding, get more support. We you know that many, many young people want to do this in the summer, and so, you know, we're always looking for the way to get to and 76,000, I guess, jobs. Yeah. So that seems crazy, but <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that would be the goal. Do we have the ability to follow up with that 76,000 like for next year? We don't typically follow up with them, um, but we are, you know, really thoughtful and diligent about advertising when the application opens and making sure that um, that sort of communication is pushed out and everybody and their mother knows that the application is open and that they can apply. Um, I do want to say SYP is awesome. I went through it when I was a kid and I loved it. Um, so it's really exciting to see like the growth of SYP. The question that you're going to is very real. My nephews applied and they didn't get it and they applied to like five different work sites. So it's really hard to, in certain neighborhoods, there are a lot less job opportunities than the number of kids. And so they live in public housing. And so every single kid in public housing, well, not every, but a lot of them are fairly familiar with SYAP. And so they're like actively looking for that opportunity to apply. So there's, there's like a 
and the nonprofits in the area are really good, but they just, there's not enough, it's a, it's a labor desert. Like there's not enough workforce opportunities in those neighborhoods, which again, is so toxic. Structural racism policies. But one thing I wanted to ask was in the report, are, are you, are you able to provide insights onto like the quality of the opportunities? Because I know that's a big tension between like the number of job yeah. opportunities versus the quality. So I, we do do a participant survey and we ask about, you know, how people felt their experience was. Um, I mean, so that will be reflected in the annual report. Um, you know, again, it's something that we're always working on with our contractor partners to make sure that, you know, we're providing plenty of technical assistance to help them. Lots and lots of uh, workshops and sessions around job development um, so that, you know, every single job is a good job and that every young person who participates has a really good experience. Megan Mark has a question online. Okay. Mark, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Hey, Megan, how are you? Hi, Mark. Um, good. <laughs> good, excellent. First, Les, uh, very sorry to see you go. It's been great serving with you all these years, and uh, I wish you the best. Um, I hope everything's okay, and um, this is for all good reasons. Uh, Dave, just in response to your question, one way to think about the scale is we typically have about 80 to 100,000 uh, students in each public school grade. So as a, obviously they get up in year in the, the older grades, the, the number goes down to more like the 80,000. So the 100,000 is you know, a pretty significant portion of those folks. But Megan, I was thinking that uh, really spurred by Dave's question, it would be interesting to look at we serve 100,000 every year. So over the course of a, you know, a decade, uh, obviously that's you know, bordering on a million people. What portion of the New York City's young people are we serving in any, it's not just any given year, but at any given five year period or 10 year period would be very interesting to look at. Um, so I hope there's a way of figuring out how to um, go about looking at that. I know some kids repeat year after year, but you also bring in new kids every year. So just an encouragement Great around point. that. Yeah, we can, you know, have to take that back and we'll see if we can first that out. Thanks, Mark. And I, I did look up the answer to my own question. <laughs> which is, <laughs> new York City's population is around 9 million and not perfect, but 14 to 24, which is a pretty close match, is about 11%. So it's about, a, the pool is about a million. So it's it's about 10%. Right, so it's that 80 to 100,000 for each grade fits pretty well. Yeah. Is there going to be like sort of a look back over the years in the report the analysis? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And you guys really touted that, right? The fact that it's yeah. the 60th anniversary. That's a big deal. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Okay. Um, thank you, Megan, well, and everybody for the you. questions. Um, we will now hear a brief update on the adult LEOA programs from SES. We are joined today by the new Deputy Commissioner of Workforce of the Workforce Development Division, Yuri Pollack, and by Assistant Commissioner Dean Jones. Good morning, colleagues. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name, as the chair said, my name is Yuri Pollock. Um, I'm brand new to this role. I think I'm six weeks old at this point. Um, you know, I've been working in workforce development in some shape or form now for about 20 years. My first job out of college actually was managing um, job training programs for special populations um, under the LIOA contract. Back when they were at HRA, I remember the Workforce Investment Board and Workforce in, um, Investment Board meetings 20 years ago. So this job seems like full circle. Um, have also had the opportunity to work at ACS immediately prior on um, employment, education, and college access programs. And um, as Dean came up and I were just talking about, 
um, have worked in higher ed as well at Wilson College and Columbia School of Professional Studies. So um, I'm delighted uh, that I get to work on workforce development on a broader scale in my new role. I um, just wanted to quickly thank um, Commissioner Kim and Executive Deputy Commissioner Gross for their confidence in me, um, Abby Jo Siegel, and the New York City talent team for their wonderful partnership. Um, and of course, the workforce development team at SBS, um, Assistant Commissioner um, Janine Jones-Sa, um, Michelle Clark, and uh, Justin Gale um, for their wonderful leadership over the past year. Um, just wanted to share with you a brief update um, on our workforce development work. Um, I know that Commissioner Kim shared a memo with you that talks about this in more depth. Um, but just quickly on the workforce one side, you'll see that in comparison to fiscal 22, um, in the past fiscal year, we've seen increases in the total number of individuals served, uh, the overall number of job openings available to our clients, uh, the average wage of those hired through the workforce one system, and also uh, the number of hires that are for full-time homes. Um, specifically to zero in and some specific numbers, uh, workforce one connected um, 23,599 to be very specific, uh, job seekers to employment opportunities with an average uh, wage of $18.61. And the vast majority of those hires, 91% were full time. Um, on the training side, uh, we saw a 3% increase in enrollments, uh, rising to nearly 7,200 uh, this past fiscal year in comparison to fiscal 22. Um, and we also saw a 33% increase in completions as compared to fiscal 22, with almost 6,400 clients into new training. So we're very happy about that. Um, some training highlights uh, we've been doing really great work um, in healthcare. Uh, 26 participants um, completed our, our NCLEX RN training program in cohorts at LaGuardia Community College and at Lehman. Um, in fact, um, the graduation of that program at LaGuardia, the next upcoming one is this Friday, and I'll um, have the privilege of joining that with some of my colleagues. I'm very excited about that. Um, on the tech side, uh, we had 31 graduations from the TTP residency at Brooklyn College and 50 from CUNY Tech Prep. Um, uh, sorry, we had 31 graduates from the TPP residency uh, at Brooklyn and 50 from um, CUNY Tech Prep secure tech positions uh, with average salaries of around 90,000 plus. Um, and 311 clients successfully completed our industrial and construction training. And on the food service front, um, New Yorkers have benefited um, from a program that I was excited to learn about um, in joining this role, which is First Course NYC, um, our, our apprenticeship program for line cooks. And uh, for that program, what is the program for what? Uh, line food service. How did you? Okay. <laughs> um, with um, 72 completing the fundamentals training and 58 going on to complete job training. Um, and um, on the media and entertainment side, our Made in New York uh, training programs likewise had a strong showing with uh, 46 participants enrolled in the post-production program and 20 in the Stagecraft Food Camp Bridge program. Um, I also had an opportunity to join an employer's roundtable for the Stagecraft Food Camp program last week round, uh, led by Roundabout Theater Company. Um, and uh, I was very heartened by both the Roundabout teams and the employer's enthusiasm uh, for the program. It's very good to see. Um, just very quickly on customized training, um, 12 businesses were awarded training in this past year, fiscal 23. Um, the sectors included childcare, education, food services, healthcare, um, information and professional services, retail manufacturing, tech and transportation. Um, about 1.2 million in funds were awarded, uh, benefiting 381 trainees who together had an average wage increase of about 7%. And just to give you one quick example, Catherine and YC, um, they're a jewelry designer and manufacturer that are located in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and they have retail locations in Williamsburg and Soho. Um, we're able to award them uh, 300,000 to train almost 80 employees in management, jewelry, manufacturing, and point of sale systems. Um, and we anticipate a wage increase of 6% from that grant to that. Um, just want to close out on workforce development one month, which is the month of September. So it's particularly appropriate that we're meeting. Um, under um, Assistant Commissioner Jones Suss leadership, uh, we've planned a number of events and activities in honor of Workforce Development Month. Um, the kickoff event is actually tomorrow at Brooklyn's Kings Bay Library. Um, our mobile outreach unit, MOBI, uh, will be offering recruitment services in a variety of sectors outside the library. And inside the library, we'll be um, offering one on one professional financial counseling to job seekers and will be engaging with local businesses in the neighborhood as well. 
Um, we have another events. Uh, we have a number of other events um, in all five boroughs in honor of Workforce Development Month. Uh, for example, there's a job fair in Staten Island, a Spectrum recruitment events in, in Queens, Spectrum uh, Telecom Cable, and um, another example, a CD, CDL individual training grant info session um, in, in the Bronx, um, as well as some professional development activities inside SBS for our staff. Um, and we're also doing some, um, a lot of extensive uh, marketing and communications work with our marketing and communications team. Um, we um, have some um, social media spots of which our leadership uh, has been fortunate to be featured in. Um, and we're um, you know, really, really making sure that more and more constituencies know about all our services. So that's my update. Just wanted to conclude um, that it's such a pleasure um, to be part of the workforce development team at SBS and I look forward to working with them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, I just wanted to find out, I don't know if you're the right person to update us on this, but in our last meeting, we talked about the high employment, unemployment rate for Blacks um, in New York. And I just wanted to see where, in terms of these numbers, where are they placing? Um, has there been any focus and have we figured out what the driver is behind that? Um, it's certainly something I'll, I'll, I'll also ask for my staff to be able to weigh in for the team. Um, it's something that we're definitely focusing on. It's definitely um, something that we're aware of um, in terms of our recruitment strategies, in terms of outreach to certain neighborhoods. Um, in terms of how the numbers have increased or decreased since the last meeting, um, I unfortunately couldn't really speak to that as much now. Um, would um, members of, of the team have any thoughts? Your reaction on the future segment. So, citywide, this is a big area of focus for the mayor, the first deputy mayor, for the, the deputy that we report to of housing, economic development, and workforce. Um, and uh, Abby Jo Siegel is like right at the center of that effort. So, if she were here, she could give you a brief update. I know they've been working very hard on trying to understand the underlying drivers and trying to figure out what we can do. Um, to be explicit about race is not always easy with federal funding, but I think the city is trying to figure out exactly what it can and cannot do and as much as it can. So I think it's by the next meeting, we probably will be able to provide an update on that. Yeah, but it is not at all forgotten. It's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Quick, quick question on that. Um, on. It's great to see the, the number of individuals served going up kind of year over year, connection with businesses, but then the, obviously the total hires are going down. Um, that may just be the year. I'm curious, like, is that a trend from 21? Is that something in specific reason why it went down over the last year, the number of hires? Sure. Um, I mean, it's something that we're watching closely. We obviously um, want the number going up year over year. Um, so, you know, one of the, so we're, you know, doing, I, I wouldn't say that it's a trend just yet, um, you know, and it's, and it's a slight decrease. Um, I would say that we're really focusing on, you know, two things and I'll ask my staff to, you know, maybe talk about some additional strategies. Um, one is the marketing and the outreach efforts that I, you know, talked about earlier, really going into the neighborhoods with our, with our mobile unit. Um, partnering with community-based organizations, uh, doing more outreach on social media um, to make sure that we're reaching everybody that we need to reach. Um, another is um, really, um, I think we've used data deliberately, but using data even in a more deliberate way, um, keeping very, very close tabs on a you know month-to-month -month basis how the numbers are going, how the number, how the trends are, um, and if we need to adjust things uh, that we're able to do it in real time. Um, and we're building some, you know, some additional capacity on our data team in order to be able to do that. Um, and um, if um, members of our leadership team have um, thoughts to add on that. Yeah, I think all of what Yuri said is true. And I think also this year has been a year of us continuing to really rebuild our foundation from COVID, right? So really looking at our programming programming, look at the quality, um, trying to identify ways that we can increase and intensify services. We've been expanding in terms of populations that we consider targeted populations as well, um, and looking just at the quality of job opportunities that we're bringing into the system. So I wouldn't say it's a trend. I just think that this was the year where we ha really had an opportunity to kind of refocus our efforts and to really align um, just better service delivery. Um, we really had to work with a system that 
had been 100% in person, then went 100% um, virtual, and then now really working in the marketing world, we're trying to figure out how do we maintain both by really identifying which pieces are, um, which really uh, accelerate our accessibility to individuals and which ones are kind of um, replications and, and ways to figure out ways to better centralize. other questions thank you i have one remedial question and i should know this because i know it's been explained before but can you clarify the difference between a total hire and a job directly connected um my understanding and um and kind of hopefully Jamie can fill in any gaps is that you know total hires are those that are hired into a role uh, through a connection of the work so if somebody comes into our system um and they're you know um hired in a they uh, within a certain period of time are hired in a role um whether it's directly placed um by the workforce one center or after receiving some workforce one services they're ultimately hired into in a certain time period, um, that number counts there. So that could be a job completely unaffiliated with Workforce One. It's just that they got hired somewhere. Correct. Yeah. All right. Yes, yeah, sort of, sort of. So it's, uh, we also want to make sure that we're um, keeping track of who we're investing in as well. So that might be an individual that received a, a number of services within our center that we consider. Um, that, that we consider valid and, and, and adding value to that individual. So we want to track kind of like where they wind up over time and the direct connection there, right? Those are the opportunities where we have direct connection to the employer themselves and we're able to validate our system. So the, the denominator of the directly connected is the openings developed with businesses. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So in a future meeting, I would just be curious Sort of following up on Edgar's point, if you looked at a completion ratio of jobs directly connected as the numerator and openings developed with businesses as the denominator, that ratio a year ago was one in three, and last year it was more like one in four. And it's awesome to have a 33% increase in the number of uh, openings developed with businesses. But curious why that completion rate is is down. Actually we'll definitely take a look at that. Okay, so I am going to turn it over to Chris now. Um so unfortunately we do not have an in-person form. Because you question answer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because it's some that um, I've always been pleased that somebody left their house and went to a one step center and registered and got an interview and got a, maybe some counseling. And then I, the person leaves and gets a job. And it, it's a good chance that that person might not have gotten that job if they hadn't gone to the one step center. Right. So a lot of people are suggesting that a Thursday night when staff calls, hello, Mr. Jimenez, how are you doing? Well, I'm working. That counts. Because he might not have been working if he didn't right. go to Bond Street or what. Yep. So it's, it's vital in terms of the unemployment. It could be high as a Pentagon. We're all trying to get that wage higher. It's not one step for me. I think that without the one step, the last 20 years, you and the unemployed and the underemployed would have been in really bad trouble. And so I'm glad they're there. The question that we're going to have is what kind of training? How do we get rid of the ITA system so we can do some decent training? Don't smile. It's, it's really insulting that we have an ITA system that doesn't work. Um, and I like the idea of uh, uh, more extensions into communities that are not served as well as it me. But thank goodness for the one source. Now you're doing new contracts. You want to refer to that as if some people be new contracts have been awarded. 
Hello. Sorry. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so we are uh, re RFPing um, our uh, Workforce One Center system. Uh, the um, RFP should be uh, released soon. Um, probably in the in uh, this. Do you have new contractors? You got the same ones for the last ten years. Or are there any other new bodies in, in town applying for running your one stuff? So um, we um, obviously the opportunity is open to all qualified uh, 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 bidders. So we anticipate um, any um, current vendors that are qualified to do so will you know put an application, and we certainly uh, uh, welcome any uh, new uh, um, you know ones to put an application as well. <laughs> okay, that's a silly. All right. Um, are there any, uh, is there any rule going to be a put in place for these contracts that you have to be a nonprofit and not a for profit contractor? I always I worry mean, about we, that. We, for profit we are not contract, a that's 10% of working money going someplace else. There's a good chance that the awards will be the same people down in place. Um, that that's something that we'll obviously have to wait to see. Any qualified bidders are encouraged to to apply. We want to hear about people's um, you know bidders' ideas, um, what they would bring to the system, what their strengths are, how they respond to the RFP. Um, I think it's impossible to predict who the bidders will be, whether they'll be the same, whether they'll be different. Uh, we obviously want to open it up. It's not a preordained process at all. Um, anybody who's qualified is is you know able to apply. They'll be reviewed. Um, and, and as yes, as defense, one of, one of the things that they've done differently this time around is that they are bidding out smaller contracts for serving target populations. That's, right. That's something that has not happened in many years. Yeah. And that is going to open the door to smaller providers that really have an expertise in serving out so well. youth, justice involved populations, foreign born New Yorkers, because we recognize that. On the one hand, we need large organizations to run big centers, but we also need the expertise to work with the target population. So they are, to their credit, they are expanding the pool of potential vendors by not making everybody compete for these really big contracts. We can't, I don't think we have the ability in city procurement to limit it to nonprofits. I don't think we would want to, but we feel confident that we are setting the stage for nonprofits that have this expertise to apply for these these target populations. It's a good change. It's a great change. Yeah. It should be local people. I wish we could limit it. We are definitely going to advertise it locally like health, but you can't you can't limit it. And do you think Chris there'll be any changes in the center bodies that have the big contracts? Have there been a lot of applications for the big contracts? Got somebody from Pennsylvania from Staten Island or something silly like that. I, you know, I think there, there's a chance there will be some turnover. Needs to be seen. There, there were some, there, you know, there were more in town. What's that? Are the new players in town? You got Seco and you got Grant and you got Goodwill and you got any new players in town that has CUNY ever tried to have to apply for some of this, Angie? Ago, they had two or three, of which they're smaller specialized ones in healthcare and some other areas. And LaGuardia, which was a generalized generalist center. They didn't last very long, so I think the Bay Square. Yeah, I think also the BCC would be an ideal atmosphere. They don't have to go through that research. Uh, so it'll be, when are these your contracts going to be awarded? So um, our timeline is to release the RFP this upcoming fall, and it would be for a uh, for a four year term. So starting starting next fall, so it would be from you know fall around fall twenty twenty four to fall twenty twenty eight. We're going to talk later about training money. Uh, there an effort from SBS and your contractors to do more training, particularly around tech training, particularly around learning tech training. <laughs> I would think that anybody that comes into your center that should be asked, how are you doing? Here's a machine. What are you going to do next? Because you might not get a job if you can't work that machine. 
You have a large system. And there's 90,000 people to your system. How many of those people come in that are looking for a job, have the skills to get the job in this new world of tech training? So I would I would think later when we're talking about you're not spending the money, or whatever you need the money. I need I need to know that your training programs are bulked up. Everybody should get a train when they walk into your system. What do you know? What do you need to know? You have to become a classroom, not just a, a place to We need the, we have the board, we got QD, we got people like myself, we got Henry Street, we got but the reality is that you've got a lot of centers, and now it's Chris saying you don't have a lot of little more local centers. I think your staff would to get together and say, okay, we're a school. We're not just an employment agency, we're just not an exchange of uh, we're a services agency. We're a school, and we've got to be careful that most of the people we're treating do not know how to use a machine. And and that's denying your obligation because we're not going to get the job if they don't. And we hear it. We hear it from our friends, our partners. We send somebody over there, they're not getting their job because they don't know that machine. And it's available. A generic curriculum for DS is available. We know from UFT and from CUNY, there are tech teachers that we gladly go out and work with in your centers for 15 people learning how to do the machine. So I really am asking you as a result of my membership on the board that uh, Scott and I have a last of our coin. <laughs> Train workers, teach them something, ask them what they know. Don't let them leave your center making their own full course or making their own job. Have them go back to the center and learn something about surviving in this world of change. That's my point, thank you. So I agree with your point 100%. Um, having a higher ed background um, that, you know, uh, just planning, just placing a client in a job is not the be all end all. And training is, you know, very, very important. And even though I've only been here uh, for six weeks, I've seen the importance that SBS has placed on training that we're gonna continue to place on it. Um, you know, both, I think it's demonstrated over the past you know, even in the time that I've worked in the system through different city agencies and also in higher ed, um, we've, uh, you, you know, mentioned ITGs earlier, we've significantly reduced the emphasis on them, although they're still available do for those don't that do might that. benefit don't from push them. that. Don't say that here, I'll go after you. They're dropping the numbers. Right, so, yeah. so yeah. we, yeah. we, we yeah. Um, all agree to that. We don't we don't, uh, we don't emphasize them as much. We are emphasizing training and partnerships with our employer partners uh, for careers that are in high demand. Um, Michelle and her team have been doing amazing work, um, and um, it's something that we're strongly focused on. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk. Just we work very closely with um, university talent workforce development team, also Joe, to ensure that the trainings that we are creating are strongly tied to occupations that are engineering employer feedback loops that that team leads. So when we understand there's a labor shortage or demand talent shortage, we devise and prefer providers to do trainings in those areas. So that's the heart of the work and we'll continue to do so across all multiple sectors, including tech. So thank you for calling tech out. It's incredibly important. Thank you. So we don't, unfortunately, we don't have an in-person forum. So there's, uh, we can't vote, but we need 16. We have, we, have, we can count the people online. We have 12. Is it as a percentage of the total board? It's gotta be it just more than 50%, number? more than 50%. 31 total members, we have that 16. I'd like to suggest this is the second meeting in a row that this has happened because we don't hold the next meeting. Did, did we have confirmed RSVPs of more than 16? And I, I think you should lean on us, lean on our peers before the next meeting. To, and I would encourage you to publish the names of the people who don't come. Seriously, I mean, if you're mentioning yeah, yeah. people who are here, let's mention people who aren't here so we can do our business. No, that's good. Good suggestion. 
maybe if people are voting with their feet, we have a smaller board. Yeah. 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 Um, so you can review the minutes at your leisure. Um, you're in the board book. If you have feedback, let us know. We don't need to vote on them. We also do have a measure that we at some point need to vote on, which is the transfer of dislocated worker to adult funding. Um, but we're not going to go into that because we don't have a quorum, so there's no. Plus, Chris, uh, yeah, this is Colleen. Sorry to interrupt. Um, on another board on which I serve, sometimes when we need a vote and don't have enough members, we can do it by email. Does do our rules allow for that? I mean, I don't just know. so you don't have to wait for you know another. No, I, I understand. We because we're subject to the open meetings law. My understanding from the oh office, right okay also to the mayor is that we have to have an in-person quorum even to trigger a vote. Yeah, so even if those were possible, we would still have to have at least sixteen people physically here. Got in the it. Room. So. Um, Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, sorry I'm not there, but I also agree with the suggestion that was made. Well, Grant sent out notices and notices and notices. Everybody knew of that. Last June was the first time my member decades. So we're not having a quorum. Little leader, you're good at this. Why, why don't we get a quorum? Largely because we're back in person. We, the board was able to do its business remotely. And now we're back in person and have to be in person to get that quorum. And we're not necessarily having success with board members coming in person. I spoke with a few uh, board members and a few, they had concerns about like traveling distance, some um, based in like New Jersey or you know, you know different places. So <laughs> like uh, the child care is another thing. And also, Look, also we want to talk about the authority and the future of the board having role in, in the workforce, if we can't get a forum, we can't have that conversation. In 2019, Chris, you never had a trouble. 2018, 17, 16, everybody goes to the pandemic, I don't want to travel, I want to take the subway, I live in Jersey. What's the story here? I would suggest that, Chris, you appoint a committee, two or three people, that they would call friends, who they were losing less, but call these people and say, you're coming or you're not coming. Well, then resign. Let's put somebody else in place. We can't go and discuss it. Move it for eight million dollars from one agency to another because we haven't got people sitting on this board. It's a privilege to be on this board. I came to that last board meeting in June. <laughs> Hello, is anybody here? Is <laughs> this still there? I would suggest, as my friends here, they. I've suggested we call these members, sign a committee. You've, you've never missed a meeting. That's not true. I missed the June one, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I never missed a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> if you get antsy on the phone calling somebody, they'll show up. Let me tell you that. Um, do something. You can't talk about our authority, our role, uh, pushing the problem with workers and who. Uh, Workers are burden, burden, burden without a workforce board. And you can't get a quorum that you're never working. Please do something. Okay, so we are excited to welcome Doug Lapari, um, Executive Director of the Office of Community Hiring, which is part of the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development. Um, Doug was recently appointed to lead the city's work to leverage the enormous purchasing power in capital construction and other services in order to prioritize the hiring of low-income individuals and residents of low-income communities and public housing developments for city-funded contracts. Please welcome Doug. Do I have a couple slides we'll put up. Uh, thank you all for having me, really excited to be here, really excited to talk to you all and begin uh, and build more of a partnership together with all of you. And I think there's there's a lot of touch points of community hiring and, and what we've already been discussing today. So just wanted to talk a little bit about what community hiring is, 
why we have it, what we've done so far, where we need to go, is, which is quite a bit. I'll prove that now. We're, we're very, very, very early on in this process. And then, you know, the, the work is going to continue, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities to learn from you all, listen to you all, build these partnerships, and really leverage the power of, of city purchasing. So why community hiring? Because you can do that. And the slides are, you know, out the top, so you'll see the slides after as well if you don't need to necessarily be here at all. But I think, and, and already what we've been discussing here today, I think is sort of highlighting why we need community hiring, sort of why, why wouldn't we do this, right? The city is purchasing billions and billions of dollars of goods and services every year. There's an enormous opportunity there in the contracts that the city does. Why wouldn't we take advantage of that, right? I think as, as some of the questions that have already been raised, there's still economic disparities, there's still disparities in unemployment, particularly in, in certain uh, sectors. So why wouldn't we take advantage of that? And community hiring is the tool to actually do that. So again, it's a really exciting opportunity and uh, there's a lot of work to do. So what is community hiring? Chris, you can move to the slide. Community hiring at its core allows us to do two things, right? The city buys not millions, not billions, but tens of billions of dollars of goods and services every year. There is an enormous amount of purchasing power that we have. This is actually going to give us the opportunity to leverage that purchasing power, set workforce goals on those contracts, and really connect contractors to the talent that they need, make sure contractors uh, have a, a pipeline of that talent, make sure that the talent is actually connected to job opportunities, right? And really driving economic mobility, connecting low-income individuals across the city and beyond to career opportunities, to real, really secure employment. The one thing that's really nice about city procurement is we buy the same thing over and over again, right? The city always needs its roads paid. We always need the same services. So there is not just necessarily an individual job opportunity, right? We were talking about earlier there's jobs and then there's career opportunities and training through procurement because there is such a regularity tied to it. There's really opportunities for career advancement and family sustaining careers. So community hiring is doing two things, right? There's there's connecting the workers to the uh, contractors and connecting the contractors to the workers, right? Which is sort of one thing, but uh, there's, there's both sides of it. And really now we'll have the tool that we've never had before and thanks to state legislation, which we'll talk about, we actually have the authority to do something that we've never been able to do in the city. So the, the next slide talks a little bit about the legislation. So just to sort of level set as to where we're at. The city has spent many, many years uh, in various uh, shapes and forms pushing for legislation at the state. I previously was at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. And for those of you who are familiar with MOTS or not familiar, we are a procurement, we were a procurement oversight agency. I had a really good look at everything the city bought, how much we spent, how much money was going into yeah. these contracts for different industries. Thank you. But one thing that we were never able to do is require that contractors hire people in the way that this legislation is going to allow, right? We have disparate programs around the city and they're that are really strong and really good, but in a, in a way we've been operating with one hand tied behind our back. We haven't actually had the tools to require that contractors employ low-income individuals and individuals who live in low-income communities. The legislation, which just passed in June, after, I, I personally have been working on this in some shape or form since 2018, um, but in the past year plus, we've had the enormous support from this administration, from you all, right, from, from a broad spectrum across the sector, across industries. It's been really, really exciting. So this, for me personally, it's been like a, a really long time coming. We got the legislation passed in June. We're waiting for it to be signed by the governor. We're eager that that happens sometime in the next couple of months. And then we can get rolling into actually operationalizing this and executing on it. So what the legislation does, it establishes a new office. And this office is centralized here under the uh, leadership of Abby Joe under Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development. And one thing that we're looking to do, right, there's a lot of work already happening, as we heard from SPS partners already. There's a lot of efforts in this space. Community hiring can help bring some of these together in the context of city contracting. 
now be able to actually develop rules that requires contractors to make best efforts to meet workforce goals to hire low income individuals and individuals from low income opportunities. For those of you who may be familiar with the city's uh, minority and women owned business enterprise program, it's, it's analogous to that in some ways where there are going to be contract hiring goals. It's very, very broad. It covers all services contracts. So that's construction, that's technology, that's human services, professional services. So there's a lot of different job opportunities out there that are created from the city spend and community hiring will be able to, to maximize that power of the purchase. One other tool that the legislation allows us to do is create a network of referral sources. And referral sources are a will be a, a broad pool of entities, some of them may be in the room right now, and beyond of people who are able to connect the workforce, we either do training, whether it's a labor union or a community-based uh, organization, other nonprofits, educational institutions, be able to connect the worker to a contractor who has a contract goal, right? Who's doing business with the city. The contractor says, okay, great, I have a goal. Now, how do I actually get the, the workers? So the community hiring office will be able to centralize, create a network of referral sources for the public, will be accessible to all. So we'll be able to make sure that not only are there goals, but the contractors are actually connected to the talent. And then we're going to be able to in certain instances, require the use of apprentices on city contracts, which is something that we've never been able to do before. So we want to expand the pool, and this is a, a citywide goal, right? Beyond just community hiring, but we want to create more apprenticeship opportunities, right? We're discussing the, the importance of career opportunities of training, um, being able to leverage the power of the city's spend to require that in certain instances will be a really powerful tool to make sure that we're not just creating jobs, but we're actually creating families the same career opportunities. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So just to, as two, two things I want to just focus on uh, in particular, the way the legislation is, is set up, it has two different models for construction and building services and building services like, you know, uh, cleaning contracts, moving contracts, security contracts. The way that the contractors will have a goal is that there will be X amount of hours worked under that contract need to be performed by individuals who live in zip codes where at least 15% of the population in that zip code is below the federal poverty threshold or are residents of NYCHA. So it's a zip code based program where there will be a goal to have X amount of hours, depending on the type of industry, depending on the type of contract it may vary. For all other services, technology contracts, human services, and the city's already doing this in the human services sector quite well. We will be allowed to set a goal that we need to hire individuals from uh, who are actually low income themselves. So it's a little bit different of a model, and that's the way that's baked out in the legislation. Happy to go into that in more detail separate if anyone has any more questions. But there's two models of making sure that we're connecting people who live in low-income communities and connecting low-income individuals themselves. Well, this is an intake center. Is there a recruitment process? Is this just going to happen by accident, or are you going to be aggressive with the contractors? We know this around the country. The community hires a great idea, but yeah. it doesn't always have reception from the business community unless you go after them. Yeah. Uh, so, so is this a relationship you're going to have with the one-stops? Is this uh, in any way... Uh, sensitive to our parents remarks of uh, last meeting about black workers um what yeah. is your number do you have how many new jobs do you expect to get out of this so the next slide we'll we'll get into a little bit of the goals once we uh and you can move to the next slide chris uh in terms of what the impact may be once this is fully mm -hmm. operational we're hoping to create thirty six thousand jobs a year generate 1.4 billion dollars in annual salaries right the city spend is is really enormous. So once this is fully up and running, we're going to have enormous opportunities. To your question on who we are working with, right? This is not an effort that one team can do itself. And there's a lot of work already happening in this space across the city. So it is plugging into the existing efforts that we're having and how, how can we work closely with SBS to make sure that when the Workforce One centers are, are connecting workers, there's a, there's a connection back to the city contract, right, where there's a goal. So it's going to be working 
and with the existing networks of uh, city and our partners externally to make sure that we are plugging into the work and that it's being tied back to the community hiring contract goals. In terms of being able to uh, target certain populations and address particular disparities, like we mentioned on in black unemployment, community hiring will be an enormous tool because one of the other things that we need to do is implement systems to track and report and collect data. So I mentioned there's a goal from zip codes. We will be able to look once it's fully implemented who is working in that zip code, demographic information, how many hours they are working, what is their trade or occupation that they're doing, and really seeing at a very, very granular level, different data points. And from there, that's where we can then know, um, like the SBS student was mentioning, how to, how to target um, based on that data, the programming that we need to do in order to address a, a particular problem area or concern or priority for, for us. So there's, yeah. Sorry. No. Uh, so that was exactly what I was going to ask about. And so are you using, are you building a software to track this or is this an existing software that you will be implementing? So we're looking to, as I mentioned, we're still waiting for the governor to sign this. From there, there's a rulemaking process six months before it goes into effect. We're exploring right now what we can do in terms of either leveraging existing city tools or identifying tools that are on the market. We, uh, there are efforts around the country to do local hiring, community hiring, and there are tools that exist to help support this. So we're exploring all of those uh, options to see what is the best approach to uh, making sure that we have the right systems in place to collect, track, and report on this. Because that's a huge part of the legislation. There's reporting obligations. There will be quarterly reporting obligations that once this is implemented, once it's rolled out, to report on the the successes at a contract level and demographic level. So it will get quite uh, detailed. Are there going to be that until there's something? Numbers or goals? I, I keep thinking about um, uh, large developers helping with housing. I asked him once, why is it that I see on construction sites so many women who are uh, in positions where they're relegating traffic on the streets rather than skilled positions? And he told me it's because they're using their position as an incentive, um, special um, special bonuses to say that they've hired and running in certain positions. And, and I could see the same thing occurring in many industries throughout the city. And this is carefully regulated and specific criteria put in so that people can obtain the same type of high living wages for the positions yeah. we know they have. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. So through the rulemaking process that we are authorized to do under the bill, there will be more clarity specifically on, on some of that. I think also a huge part of the the work that the community hiring office will do and the city is already doing is is looking at exactly that type of uh, data, right? Of who is actually working? Are they just meeting a contract goal or is it something that we're actually providing career opportunities, right? Part of what we can do is require apprentices. So we'll be able to drill down into the apprenticeship level who is connected with apprenticeship programs. So for construction, for example, are there opportunities across all of the trades, or is it just in particular uh, trades? And what will it mean to actually meet a goal, right? Um, which will depend on the particular industry, like you said, and, and making sure that there's actual career opportunities and not just sort of checking a box for a company. So that's definitely a- I think it's really great. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'm sorry. I'd love to have you come back and, and let us know the progress. Having yeah. done this, not at this scale at all, but having been the MWP officer, trying to meet contracting goals yeah. around local minority women in jobs, what I find is if there's not, like data is wonderful <laughs> and great, but it can also be very performative. And right. once you get into that role, getting contractors to adhere to that needs a real like designated, in this, in this instance, not a person, a team, to hold them accountable and be able to look at that like step by step 
And um, Laura, to your point, seeing that, you know, in many of these trades, what happens is that they go back to who they normally hire. And then you end up looking at it six months later and they have not met their goals and they're trying to throw folks in the zip codes or whatever your demographics are into the sweeping and cleaning and flag holding. So I would really love to hear back from you around like how you are gonna really hold them accountable because all the systems in the world are not the same as a person saying this number is not correct. Tell me what, where you're going to do this hiring. So I, I would love to hear that. Yeah, and absolutely. We'll be reporting back regularly as we go through this. this process. Where are you with the unions? You know, Chris, you and I, a few years ago with Gary coming in, Gary coming out, with what 20 was with the healthcare, the DC 37. And it seems to me the question of support not just Gary the Barber and the building trades, but the painters, large numbers of subcontractors. Not just Henry, but it's 420 in the healthcare city hospitals, large numbers of subcontractors. And on you go, the same thing with <clears throat> whatever you want to look at with the smaller units like RSTW who want this to happen, they're supporting it. But your staff has to stay in touch with yeah. each of these affiliates. These, uh... Yeah, and we. I know, Abby, I'll let you speak to it because I think you have much to share. Um, the legislation itself brought, because we were working at this for so long, it brought a really broad a spectrum of uh, people around the city to support this. We had a lot of union support. We've been working with them over the years on trying to expand pre apprenticeship and apprenticeship slots and really uh, drilling deep into that. And, and we did get a lot of support. And now this is going to be another tool that will really sort of strengthen what we can actually do. We've always had a bit of lacking on the back end where our contractor didn't need to have a goal. Now there will be a goal. So it's a really, it's a really good tool. And I think you're all absolutely right. There's not anything that we can do just alone. It's it's really building the partnerships, leveraging it and, and making sure and holding people accountable to make sure that they're actually meeting the goals. Fortunately there's a ton of support around the city too, right? We've been talking to city agencies. This was a mayoral priority. This was the first deputy mayor uh, going up to Albany regularly to push for this. It impacts the entire city. So all of the, the city hall leadership is really on board, making sure the commissioners are on board as well. Everyone's excited about this, which I think is gonna also be helpful for making sure that the, the teams around the city who are managing city contracts are uh, supported and, and on top of it as well. That's just the answer. 36,000 jobs just from that. You don't have one step totally in touch with res. If we, uh, and, and now your zip codes, any zip code you have is a nitro. Right. Yeah, well, that one nitro is a huge. They don't always come through for jobs for their own people. We know that. So yeah. it's a matter of. <laughs> you know, my, mine was just on the um, on the apprenticeship program, at least on the slide. Yeah, it seemed like there was uh, there were certain contractors, which means some contractors would be excluded. I'm just curious on what what industries or, or contractors or uh, awards would be excluded from that. So the the bill itself covers all procurement contracts um, and services contracts. So goods contracts are not covered underneath the the, uh, the legislation. The way the legislation this is getting a little technical into the the way the bill is drafted. We will be able to set apprenticeship goals across construction, any industry. It will depend, obviously, on the where you know our goal is to increase capacity and uh, pool of apprentices. We don't want to set a goal on a contractor that is not a, a pool of viable apprentices, but we're using it as a way to expand uh, opportunities to create actual registered apprenticeship programs. Um, but they will be registered apprenticeship programs with the New York State Department of Labor. So that's one of the, the pieces that will need to be uh, part of any requirement. But we do have a broad range of how we can require and when we require it. How we will do that is, remains to be seen. I just want to say this is a tremendous tool in terms of job generation for the city. And it's incredible that we actually got it over the finish line at the state. Um, it is going to take well to actually achieve its promise, which is what I think you're all saying. It's not going to be just our office. It's going to be because we're partnering with all of you and really thinking through 
how do we make sure there's an incredibly strong supply of talent coming out of these referral agencies? So when the contractors or anyone says, I don't know where to go, we can say, you go here, you go here, and you go here for these particular occupations. And the goal is, to be our apprenticeship goal is not to just do it in apprenticeship, but do it across the occupations that span what powers the city. So the more we can get apprenticeship programs for all the occupations, so the contractors can't say, oh, there are no apprentices there, it's just in the trade. That's not where we want to go. So working on it, and because this legislation requires us to be registered with the Department of Labor, really working with folks to help get their apprenticeship program with the Department of Labor, something that we don't have particularly outside of the traditional trades here in New York. So that's something we hope we can change and work with New York State Department of Labor to do so when they're interested. But I just want to like, we will be as responsive when we're doing and building out this office as fast as possible. We are, it's great that it's in this office and not somewhere else in the city, but it is going to take sort of ongoing conversations and more than just the public sector rolling up their sleeves and figuring it out. We really need to do it in partnership with all of you. Um, so I just wanted to say, like, this is just the beginning, and I'm hopeful that, um, you know, there is community hiring in other places. Um, when I first started working on waterfront parks way back when, there were water park projects in other places in New York City, so falling into the river. Um, now we have the best parks of any place, waterfront parks of any place in the world. That's what's going to happen here, but only because you're going to put all of Joe's expertise, all of Jocelyn's, all of everybody's around at the table to figure out how to do it and really make it make the case to industry. So this is a real win for them as well as for anyone for the city as well as anyone who's working. Um, so I just wanted to like set the stage here a little bit, like we're early days, but we hear you. Um, but we're gonna also need to have you roll up so you can help support this effort overall to make the business really work well. Um, and then I just want to say I'm sorry I was late. Um, Amazon had its opening today. Um, this gives me an opportunity to say to you, I want to thank you because of all these years, workforce, my complaint, workforce is not a priority. <laughs> the career pathway is a joke. That monetized. And you, you've come along and you've put it out there. Now it's our obligation. Before you came, I was suggesting to Chris and Edgar and others that we get on the phone. You're on the board, it's a privilege. But you can't not come. Workers are dependent on this board as a commentary on your problems with the machine and the problems with security and the problems with the app. And we want to get on the phone and say, actually, I recommend we put Angie on the phone. <laughs> That's always a good idea. Yeah, it's always a good idea. She told me to do it. But now, we, I, want, no, I want to say that workers, that this now becomes the workforce is best important. The work is best important, not the small business or business working. Oh, I sit home on my ass in Jersey workforce board. This is a reality. Uh, Can I just say I came day. from Jersey? I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Well, we know you're sure. You have to. You have to go to the Bronx. <laughs> So I'm gonna um, just say thank you, Abby. Thank you, Doug. Wonderful to meet you. This is, I think, one of the most exciting announcements um, that I've been part of this world. I don't for quite a bit few years. This is really awesome. Obviously, double in detail to avoid all of the um, things that we were talking about that Johnson had raised. Um, a question on like what the baseline is. So I feel like you know we talked earlier. Megan sort of said you know she can remember the days of thirty thousand and now we're at hundred thousand. The city's been like trying and poking around at this. EDC's been doing a little bit. And again, I want to honor those very humble roots to get to here, but I feel like we have to tell that story. And so I'm curious if there's been any level of trying to measure the baseline for kind of where we have been. Yeah, and that, that's the, the short answer is we're trying and we're working. We have some bits of data um, that we're piecing together. But part of the problem is there isn't a cohesive, unified ecosystem of how the city as a whole. But if you had to ball, like it. knowing that, if you yeah. had to ballpark it, like what has it been? So I don't have, I don't have that it's data today, even. but we, we're working towards that to try to piece what, what we know uh, we're doing today to the best of our ability. Like I said, there's different, the way the legislation is, is drafted is a different model than some of the ways that we've been doing this. So we're trying to sort of piece it into that. As we have more data, right, we're establishing baselines, we'll have to, we'll, that's, that's a huge part of what we're right, trying to figure out where we're at in order to know where we need to go. 
um, so it's definitely something we're exploring. We can move forward. Yeah. It would be really interesting yeah. to kind of think about like what are the bright spots, even if they're extremely humble, small bright spots. Just what does that look like? So yeah. then, as Joe's saying, as board members, we could be fantastic advocates if we can show the analog of it's like this but better. Or if it's sort of like this but in a much more improved. Yes, we can look at some of the data because we definitely do have have data, and it's it's despite having this legislation, we've actually been doing a, a, a good job at, at making sure that people are connected from the uh, from the communities. But it's this is just going to give us an additional tool. Right. So and yeah, as fun as it is to collect, I would yeah. really urge us by like the next meeting or whatever to just get a sense of what's been working. I think it would be really helpful. This is super exciting. So I think the, yeah. the biggest program that has worked well is hiring my human services, which has existed for a long time and it's basically a requirement to hire. It, it's on human, city human services contract. It's required to hire one public assist, one cash public assistance recipient for every $250,000 in different mm -hmm. And a couple, I, I don't know this last fiscal year, but I think in 22, it was over 3,000. So that was the single biggest success that we've had, in part because most of these these are nonprofits for the most part. They are living out their missions. They are hiring people that they are serving, and so. But it has been it has been successful, and now we need to expand that to other services, and especially we can certainly look at what we know about in terms of like the EDC program. SBS helps employers fill some of their positions through hiring my Great, thank you. One point, sorry. Hello, 97 rules just came out of freezing crazy. Um, so one thing I wanted to just make sure that as this process is being developed, that there's like a clear understanding of like because for MWBEs, especially in like the consulting space, which are a, like really large contracts, people tend to use waivers like nothing and they get approved very easily. Um, so that's kind of one thing I would love to know the next time we have a conversation about this. The next thing is, and this is just more of a personal frustration and thought process here is it would be great to know like how New Yorkers, low income New Yorkers, specifically black and brown folks are being um, prioritized for contracts that are not physical labor. I think a lot of times people like easily will be like, okay, physical labor you know, cut and dry, but, you know, folks are way more than their physical bodies. Um, so it'd be great to know kind of, again, I, I heard a big focus on construction, which is great, but I would love to know, like in the consulting and yep. the service space, how community hiring is not just going to be brushed off because a lot of those firms will, you know, those large consultants are going to be like, oh, we tried and we couldn't find anybody that yep. has a PhD and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, arbitrary roles. that's so absolutely great points um in terms of like a waiver process part of what like waiver is it is a best efforts based program so there does do the legislation need to be some sort of process to account for that what that will look like is going to be uh hashed out through the rulemaking process and definitely interested in, in any feedback on that but something definitely we're mindful of we don't this is not a and I, i've seen this firsthand from the mwb program it's we don't want people to just be like okay i tried yeah. Now I'm just going to continue yeah. as, as status quo. That's definitely not um, what wants in the program. We will, we will not allow that to happen. Um, particularly in other areas like tech and the professional services, that that's something that I'm particularly excited about because there are working models in construction. We know that there's there's a very like there's a free apprenticeship, apprenticeship, and that so that works and it's great and there's opportunities there, but we don't have necessarily that same exact model in other spaces, and particularly in the city. Like Chris mentioned, there's a human service, hiring IT human services. There's some hiring IT work in the construction space. We have nothing in those spaces. So this is going to be an enormous tool to actually look at the city spend, and this is what we're doing now, right? We're, we're looking at how much we're spending in a given year or over a time period in, in particular sectors, particular agencies, and seeing what are the actual job opportunities, and then already had a meeting this week with the tech town and pipeline team here to see, all right, how can we now make sure that here's going to be the, the list of career opportunities? How are we actually connecting the people to these job opportunities? So that's definitely something um, that we're, this is not just a, get a 
any old job. This is getting career opportunities, whether it's in construction or human services, technology, there's engineering contracts, right? There's a, there's a ton of, uh, let's assume this is professional uh, type services that are, are part of the program and will have to be meaningful. There's some momentum in those areas around They're really trying on that side to rethink how they're doing talent pipelines. So, in some way, it's hard to just come together right now in New York City. We can show how it can happen in a way that really um, supports both the, the industry leaders who are hiring. What's the timeline on getting it signed? And do we, you guys, need some? in terms of actually getting it signed? What's that process like? Picking up from the governor? Yeah. She's got a whole bunch of bills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I think we're thinking about it, and I think there's going to be so many iterations, right, and learnings along the way and pivots that need to happen. But, like, if we can't get started, right, it's sort of pointless. And so I'm, I'm, I want a little bit of clarity around that, I guess. We were working um, with Thank you all. Okay, um, so we are going to have to move the presentation that was going to be um, for, for advancing the careers and expertise with disabilities to the next meeting. Yeah. And that next meeting is December 8th at 9 a.m. In person. In person. And we will take Dave and go. Guy recommendation that we have to talk to people and get some real assurances that people are going to be here in advance of the meeting. Um, so, do I have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? We have four minutes. We can't leave. We can't. Stay. All right. All in favor? Hi. Guys, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.